Oh my god. Rescue now, one. Oh my god. <laughs> Ik heb een Ik heb Ik heb een Ik heb een Ik heb een Ik heb een I don't see a cat. Oh, 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 we need to close this computer. Yeah. 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 Oh, it's that pipe. Lampy, jongens, have you got a lamp? Oh, it's like a light. Yeah. Uh, we can also go the I think we have a. We're getting a light. Als je die los maakt, dan zit er altijd een in de achterkant. Ja, maar kijk, die boom zit er een in de achterkant. Kijk daar, dat soefie. Als je die los maakt, dat bandje. Ja, maar er zit er altijd een in de achterkant. Kijk, die boom kan je open trekken. Dat kan niet. Kijk, hier zit mij van de schoepie en hier zit ook een schoepie. Dus als je hier is, dan is het Als je die twee pakt, dan kom je alle twee bij. Pak je die twee. Ja? En dan is het dus. Oh, oh. Je kunt het horen. 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 Je kunt het Heb je geen plan als je Die ligt hier ook. Dan kom je niet meer weg. Ik heb gezegd dat je nog verder terug En dan moet je die rol op de plaats krijgen. Die kunnen we bijbrengen. Ik sta op mijn kop, sla ik hem even om. Ik heb het gewoon niet in de 
So they need a rope. Ja. 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 Hij zit in die bocht daar. Dus ik denk als je gewoon in die bocht dan kunnen in één kijk, in doorzaal. Hij zit meer naar rechts toe, weet je wel. Ja, maar je ziet Pak hem maar even met die zaag, hoor. Ik zie hier in de kitchen. Ja, we moeten gewoon die bocht even aan de Ah, Sam. Kun je een situatie? Waar? Hier beneden. Ik zie zo'n auto. Ik hoor het hem hier krabben. Hij wil eten, hij wil eten. Waar is het eten? Ik heb hier niet te veel schip. Hier. Ik ga Ja, dat is hier. Hier is eten. Ja, dat is wel dorst hebben. Misschien eerst wel water. Ja, Moet je hebben met een beetje like water of zo? Ja. Hey, check is there water? Water? Ja. Yeah. Like, uh, little... like a cup of water? Yeah, it's really thirsty. Eten. Eten. Oh, he's all dirty. Oh, he's all skinny. Oh, well, have you done that, Yes, Yeah, he comes by our house. You're at 11. We're at 11. Yeah. Hey. 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 This was already open. Uh, I think it was opened now. Was it already open? I, think? I don't know. Hey, yeah. 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 gonna get some water. Oh, she must be so freaked out. Or he, right? He. Yeah. Small boy. So freaked out. Oh. Is it Sam? It's Sam. Yeah. Here's Sam. Oh, Here's Sam. Thank you. Oh, 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 thank and you know what? The fire department are leaving. Yeah, they, what about that mess? <laughs> So good evening everybody. Um, I'm glad that there's, there's this many people who aren't interested in uh, football. <laughs> um, and, uh, so welcome to Hot Pot Lab 7. Um, we have two presentations today. One is by um, our own uh, SRG STEM research group, which we just started this year. And it's a group of four young uh, researchers um, that have been looking at sort of what it means to make music today with new tools and uh, computer technology. So they've been preparing for this presentation on sort of wrapping up some of the talks we've been having. Uh, after that, we're very happy to have uh, Bob Ostertag, whose um, activities are not just in electronic music, but many other things. And um, I'm not sure what he's going to um, do today, but he'll be talking and maybe playing some music. So um, I'm going to pass it on to our researchers. So uh, my name is John. This is Georgios. Um, we're two members of the research group. Uh, also in the audience here, uh, these two lovely members of our research group is uh, Barrett and Timo Pinar. <laughs> Timo Pinar. Um, yeah. So uh, we're we're the guys, and they're the girls. <laughs> um, yeah. So we started this research group about three months ago, and. 
we've just kind of been looking at recent trends in music technology and seeing how they would apply to the process of building better instruments and kind of like uh, not just better instruments but the next generation of instruments you know smarter faster better stronger whatever. Um, and the, the main question that's kind of been guiding our, our, our research is uh, how can we help our artists make better instruments so um, before we start we should probably define what we're talking about when we say an instrument um, it's it's not just the interface it's not just the visual part of it um, it's a more complex system it um, it's it is the interface but it's also the sound source it's the system of mappings between the interface and how the sound is created um, so you know good example of that is the, the clarinet right um, the clarinet everybody knows the clarinet uh, it's got these finger buttons that's your input and you blow uh, <laughs> and uh, you, you just kind of take it for granted if you're a clarinet player that you know the system that you've got is going to make sound when you blow into it but what's really going on inside of there is this stuff I mean there, there's a quite a complex physical system going on inside um, so really I mean, when you think about an instrument it's the set of inputs and then it's this, the sound making system. And then it's how you connect these inputs to the sound making system. Um, now, the, the clarinet's also an interesting um, example because it's an example of a fairly volatile system. And that, that's something we're quite interested in um, because volatile systems tend to be very, um, well, they have boundaries you can find and push. And with the clarinet, um, those boundaries become very obvious if you ever pick one up and try to play it without knowing how to play it because it squeaks like crazy and that's because inside there is this wild physical system and so while even a really great clarinet player um, may feel like they have full control of the system you never really do you know you're, you're always just kind of wrangling this very volatile system so um, yeah, onto the layout of the clarinet well, the clarinet is a presentation of basic Western musical ideas. We got like pitch, harmony, this kind of stuff, right? Um, and the way the clarinet presents it to you is in a sort of uh, linear fashion, because it's, it's a melody instrument. So you're playing linear notes with it. And um, what, what we've been talking about that as is like the instrument's topology or its geometry, which is kind of uh, the way it makes you play music, the way it makes you understand music. So the clarinet has a very linear, melodic way of making you understand music. Um, contrast that with something like the accordion, which is a chordal instrument. So it makes you think in terms of chords. And on top of that, the, uh, these buttons over here, I don't know if anybody here has ever played an accordion, um, but the way it works is that you play melody lines on this side and you play kind of like backing chords on this side. Um, now, the reason that you don't play melody lines on this side is because of the arrangement of the buttons. Like the geometry of these buttons makes it so that it works if you play backing chords. It's actually arranged in fifths. So the accordion is a great instrument for playing folk music on because you can hit like the one, four, five sweet spot really easily on it. You try to play some Bach on there and it's not happening. Well, I've seen it happen, but it's it's not easy. <laughs> um, so yeah, these are traditional instruments. They present um, these unique geometries, which is one of the issues we've been talking about. And um, they're also representative of these sort of systems that meld input and these physical systems and mapping between those two things. So like, how does that translate to the digital domain? Um, and you've probably all seen some diagram like this at some point in some paper at nine. Uh, this, these are kind of like the elements of the system mapped to the digital domain. So we've got our physical input, right? That's like your sensors. You've got your sound generating source, which is your usually song, like you got your Maximus P or Live or whatever. And then you've got the way you map this physical input to your sound source. So your sound source has all these really specific parameters that it accepts. And your physical input has all these really specific parameters that it spits out. Mapping is kind of the process of meeting those two in a way that feels intuitive. Because in the end, you want it to feel intuitive. You want it to feel like an instrument, right? You don't want to feel it. You don't want it to feel like this, mm -hmm. right? Um, so these are the elements of the system of the system in the digital domain. 
there's also um, the parameter space because now you're not working with um, you know standard uh, Western concepts of pitch and harmony anymore. You've got these sound generators that have all of these crazy parameters that uh, you know often change on a per instrument basis, right? So not only does your your topology of your instrument, your uh, your geometry of your instrument enter a whole new world, but the language you use to define it changes. Like you're, you're using things like grain increment now instead of pitch. So um, some popular trends in performance systems that we've been looking at. Uh, Martha Stewart really likes the, the a APC 40. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this is, this is one of the things that is really catching on right now, is these grid controllers. And we noticed that, and we kind of looked at them, and we wanted to see, well, why are they so hot? You know, what's so interesting about them? And um, not just from a performer's perspective, but also from an audience's standpoint. Like, are, is it fun to watch people play these things? Um, another thing, touchscreens. Everybody's got an iPhone. Um, now, I, I just asked the question, you know, is it entertaining to watch somebody play one of these things? Well, I just saw a video that may uh, convince you either, in either direction. Let's see. This is one of the premier, like, button grid performers. His name is Edison, if you're curious. That's kind of the, the epitome of, of where this, this paradigm is at right now. Um, but that doesn't really represent the majority of what people are doing with these button grid interfaces. Um, these button grid interfaces actually came out of the software, which I'm sure you all know, called Ableton Live. Um, because Ableton Live kind of took uh, the studio DAW paradigm, DAW meaning digital audio workstation. It's kind of like the computer evolution of like the big mixing desk. And it, it took this paradigm, which um, was used by people in production studios who were very accustomed to using computers to make music in the beginning, and made it performable. Like that's kind of uh, what I really like about live is that it took the DAW, like the DAW interface, and made it into something you could perform. And that was like uh, you know seven or eight years ago, like a big revelation. So ever since then, all of these uh, controllers have been kind of emerging out of this paradigm. Um, but it's still kind of looking at performance from the studio vantage point, you know, rather from what we would like to look at it from, which is the instrumentalist viewpoint. You know, how would an instrumentalist, not a, a music producer, want to make live music with a computer? So we kind of like nailed down some qualities that we were interested in when we were looking at instruments and like how to make them better. Um, stability is a big one. Because if you're going to build an instrumental practice on something, on a piece of technology, you want it to be stable. You don't want to have to like upgrade your clarinet every five months, you know. Um, and also, stability means that the uh, the concept is kind of locked down. What, and what that means is that um, with a computer system, it's really easy to change your instrument. I mean, you can go into Max, change a couple patch chords, and now you've got like a whole new system. But um, stability kind of implies that 
you don't do that. Like you, at some point, you kind of stop and you start building a practice on that instrument. Um, another thing, it's got to be real time. I mean, that kind of goes without saying. Um, it doesn't tie the performer to the screen. Now, this is actually something that we kind of argue back and forth about because um, some of us believe that uh, visual feedback actually distracts you from the process of making music, whereas some of us believe that visual feedback can enhance the process of making music. It's interesting, interesting thing to think about. Um, and personal. Um, what I mean by personal is that we want our instruments not to dictate how artists perform, but rather the artists to dictate the instruments and their creation process and this sort of stuff. And of course, um, because we're dealing with live performance, and when we say live performance, like live, live performance, not mixing prearranged parts, we want it to be spontaneous with kind of an improvisor, uh, improvisational approach to the moment. I mean, that sounds really fluffy, but um, when, you're, when you play an instrument, you kind of know what that means. You, you just know. You intuitively understand you know, what it's like to play an instrument and how you're really like, shaping time as you go, um, rather than like, putting pieces together, which is another thing about what these grid systems kind of force you into, is this system where you're like, taking prearranged parts, just kind of slopping them together, well, elegantly slopping them together. Um, but you're not really like in in the front, the full front of the moment when you're when you're doing this. You're kind of like taking things that at one point were at the front of the moment and putting them together. So yeah, we were uh, kind of like nailing down these things that we were after, and um, we realized that uh, you know it's important to start from the performance when you're designing an instrument mm -hmm. rather than from um, the technology, which is very very tempting to do because. Um, I mean, let's face it, like sensor technology is super cheap now. So anybody can just like grab a bunch of accelerometers and be like, oh, cool, accelerometers. Like, what can I do with these? Rather than starting from the performance, you know, from, from the performance point, like really thinking, okay, how do I want to perform? What are my needs as an artist? And then bringing technology in to suit those needs. Um, so we want to take these personal desires and turn them into performance systems. And those performance systems are all these mappings that we've been talking about. Um, so what types of mappings are we interested in? And this is something that we've, we've been researching. Like, What are the various mappings that we want to look at? Um, Georges, you want to talk about, a bit about mappings? Uh, yeah, sure. Hi. Uh, sure. Firstly, uh, you've got the physical input to data. So uh, there are okay, many different kinds of controllers that you, one might use. Uh, and this produce different kinds of data, but also different ranges of data. So how you transform this uh, data into computer and how is this basically going into your software instrument is one, one kind of mapping that we've been looking into. Um, now this can be, you can um, do some, uh, they, can, they could be linear or non-linear on one hand. So meaning that um, if you take um, uh, let's say the Wii uh, example, you might want to do uh, a very big movement that is going to lead to some data that you're going to use, but at the same time you might want some uh, uh, very small, some nuanced movement with your fingers with this. So this also needs to produce data that is readable and usable in your computer. So the mapping of, of the movement to data has to be non-linear because a big movement has to create um, equally uh, usable data as a small nuance. Um, this is one thing, and of course you need to do, at some cases, data pre-processing, which means that uh, the data that is coming out of your sensor needs to be scaled so that it's usable, or maybe data from one uh, sensor is manipulating and uh, dictating how uh, data from another sensor is going to be used. So, yes. Mapping uh, from physical input to the data in your computer is one kind of mapping we've looked at. And the second is how the data that you finally have in your computer after the sensor is going to be used in the sound parameter space. Now, by sound parameter space, we mean the software that you're using, of course, but um, this could be either for sound creation or manipulation of sound, which are two different things. Now. Um, I wrote here that we have multidimensional data because 
Um, if you take an example such as um, a granulator, which is an effect for manipulating music, it, has, it can have maybe 20 different parameters, but when you want to use it uh, in a live situation, you really want to map it into two or three different parameters in the controller, whether it's uh, an interface that you built yourself with different sensors or something that's pre-existing, uh, like the way that I got to before. So you really need to get out of uh, fewer controllers more data and you need to find ways to multiply them and send them to the software or where you need. Um, yeah, here this is a, an example where uh, bottom grids, uh, you actually basically there are switches and you turn on and off states of, of your system. And here you have a smaller a controller where uh, through the breath, through the power of, of your lungs and the air that you, come, that you get out, you can control more than one parameter, uh, which is you know, usually the opposite of what happens with the previous controller, where you basically hit a switch and it starts a process. This, out of the mouthpiece, you can have, you know, it could dictate the uh, volume as well as the pitch or dynamics and a lot of different stuff. So, here we've got um, the hands, which is uh, this instrument that was built at time, and it's using. Uh, I, I wanted to stress with this that uh, with one kind of, of data control, you can uh, manipulate how other data is communicating to your system and how uh, one set of data uh, affects and uh, uh, yeah, scales the other set of data. Okay. All right. Um, so um, one thing that we also looked pretty heavily into is how an instrument can give you feedback that either makes your performance better, brings you more into the moment, or even advises you, you know, on what you could do next. Um, one of the things we looked at was data visualizations because not only is it a great way of getting feedback with visual creatures, right, uh, but also it's it's kind of a big thing now because of these touch screens. And with touch screens, you're, you're actually manipulating the visualization. You know, there, it's kind of a weird mixture between the physical and the virtual. Um, so with data visualizations, one thing uh, that's important to realize is that, okay, we're working with these huge sets of data, right? We're, we have all these sensors giving us data. We have all these parameters we're trying to map to. Um, there's a lot of dimensions and a lot of data. And data visualizations really don't tell you about the data specifically. What they do is they kind of give you an overview of trends and stuff like that. Um, so, for example, this is a really, really cool data visualization that I, I saw not too long ago. Um, it's actually a map of the internet, and it's visualized as the Tokyo subway system. <laughs> and so, it shows all of these complex relationships that you never would have really picked up on otherwise. It's, it's really funny, like um, Google here, the Google headquarters, which is like the biggest piece of the internet, um, it's in this Shinjuku district, which is like the busiest place, I guess, in, in Tokyo. Um, uh, and um, yeah, I mean, if you, you can't really see it very well, fortunately. Uh, but on each of these, there's kind of like these pipes that run between them and kind of show relationships. Like you have advertisements, so you have like AdWords and it routes over to double click. And then you have um, you have this red one, which is identity, right? So if you follow identity, you go through friend feed, you go through Gmail, you go through Orcut, you go through Plaxo, you go through Friendster, and you get to Facebook. But now Facebook also attaches to the application line, mm -hmm. and um, so on and so forth. You get like these interesting ways of thinking about things that you wouldn't have gotten otherwise, and that's kind of the blessing of data visualization. It's also because it's essentially very non-orthogonal. Yeah. Non yeah, yeah. Um, meaning that it's it's not Cartesian, yeah. like it's using more cognitive ideas and, and showing their relationships. 
Um, yeah, so I mean, that, that's one of the really interesting things about data visualization. So um, another problem with data, data visualization is that you have all this, these high dimensions, but we have to restrict ourselves to looking at it on a 2D screen. So I mean, okay, we can kind of imagine what three dimensions looks like. Try to imagine four dimensions. All right, now think about how many dimensions there are in one of these instruments. I mean, you know, like at least 10 dimensions, if not 50. Um, so how do you make that into something you can see in 2D? And um, there's various techniques for that. Um, this is a, a technique called projection. And this is a very simple example because I'm just projecting 3D onto uh, 2D rather than like 20D onto 2D. Uh, but it's interesting because it kind of shows how you can look at the data here differently, especially if you start turning this around. Because it's just kind of like taking a, sh a shadow of it, basically. It's, it's almost like um, Joel gave a really great example at one of the meetings where you look at a piece of paper like this. So this is three-dimensional, right? You look at a piece of paper like this and project it to 2D, you get a rectangle. You do it like that, and you get a line. And there's all kinds of abstract shapes in between for understanding what this piece of paper is like. So take that. And um, we think, OK, well, what can we do with these data visualizations? Well, we can use them to better understand our systems. Um, we can use them to also aid our performance. And they, what, what's great about data visualizations, if used properly, I think, um, is that they can kind of give you a way to navigate through your space, navigate through this like geometry, this typology that we were talking about. They give you a way of seeing it and kind of understanding it in an intuitive way. Um, and in this case, we're talking about like presets. You know, if you have like a bunch of presets and you can navigate through those, or sample sets, mm -hmm. or these kinds of things. Um, and uh, yeah, so an example of, of that would be: Does anybody here know about uh, Google's Wonder Wheel? Does anybody use the Wonder Wheel? No, really? Oh, that's super cool. <laughs> it's like one of their hidden gems on uh, on Google.com. Okay. Hmm. Oh, look. Bob Ostertag, is it? It's <laughs> <laughs> kind of half expecting like the football game announcement to be on there. <laughs> So Google's Wonder Wheel is basically an attempt at mapping the internet and giving you a way to interactively navigate through it visually, using visualization. So we start with Stockhausen. Oh, okay, Ligeti. Now imagine if you had an instrument like this where you could like go through parameters or even samples, say you're like a, a mixed DJ or something like that, you can go through your, your mixes like this. Um, this is kind of where we see the, the possibilities for, for data visualization um, as sort of these, these interactive performance aids. Somehow we ended up on a lab reborn baby. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, right, so uh, <laughs> some of the things that we've been looking into uh, with the SRG is how we can develop new instruments that uh, will help us have more exciting, uh, more interesting um, uh, performances of music, but also how to use the computer in a way that uh, we can play music with it. Not in the sense that it will be uh, uh, playing music uh, itself and then uh, improvising with a human composer, but mostly to uh, assist in different ways. Now, one way that we thought that this would be useful is if the computer would be able to listen to what you're doing, and then if you're doing a sample-based um, 
performance, listen to what you're doing and then uh, suggest some sounds that could be coming next into your performance. Um, so this is a target that we would like to have, it's something that we would like to see if, uh, in the future in our instruments. But this brings three main topics into our research and what we have been looking into. And the first one is how are the samples analyzed. So think that I have my sound bank and um, I, want to, to, I want the computer to choose what uh, it's going to suggest for me. Uh, so yes, how is it going to analyze the samples that I already have in order to see uh, what is going to be relevant. And um, usually how is this done? It's uh, done through uh, systems, through ways, and uh, yeah, through ways of uh, music information retrieval. And uh, this is usually uh, looking for the frequency content of the sound. It's also looking for the duration, the volume, the RMS of the sound, the noisiness that it has inside and other stuff. But this is not a sufficient way to look into samples when you want a uh, suggestion like this. Because if you think, and this happened through some uh, music information retrieval uh, experiments that uh, we've been doing lately, but uh, if you take two hi-hat samples, they might give you very similar profiles of the sound. So meaning that uh, what you get, the idea that you get out of these parameters is more or less the same. But if you listen to the sound themselves, Maybe they have similar uh, frequency content, but one of them is generated by a synthesizer, it's an electronic sound, and the other one could be uh, a natural sound. And when you're performing and you have a certain um, aspect, set, certain needs, and a certain palette of sound that you're using, then this is not sufficient. What we would like to have is uh, metadata on every sound, that it's more related to the perception of, of us to the sound rather than its physical uh, qualities. Going from there to the second, uh, okay. Uh, now, in order to get this metadata, uh, you can have them this in, in two ways, basically. Once, one side is that uh, the artists themselves uh, put the metadata on the sound. And this is going to be very hard because firstly you have to give a really big amount of data and examples to your computer so it has something to judge. And secondly you need to carefully think about uh, all the different judgments that you're going to, to base all your samples upon. Mm -hmm. um, and thirdly you need to find the vocabulary that is going to be efficient and consistent. So you might start with some parameters but when you go to some very different uh, samples, sample examples. Uh, you know, probably the vocabulary that you have made is not going to be good enough and then you need to reinvent and work on the same thing over and over and yeah, this we're not very sure it's going to work. Another way though that we've been looking into um, is if the tags and if the uh, metadata on the sounds is, um, is given by other human users. Now of course on the internet there are many different uh, examples of um, metadata added by the community, by all the listeners of, of the music. But then again, this we're not sure that is the case and the solution to the problem either, because uh, you're not very sure that the, firstly what another person uh, is going to perceive from a sound is going to be, uh, you're going to agree with it basically. And secondly, if the vocabulary that they are using is good enough for the kind of performance that you do, or the kind of search that you do through your through your uh, data set. But you do a system without a, without a language layer. In other words, you can separate them spatially instead of linguistically. If you present me a corner of the map and you show me two things that you think are close together, and I just push them apart because I think they're not close, I'm giving you a lot of information about what I think mm -hmm. the map is like. Without having to use language, just by using a sense of nearness and farness, basic distance. I see. So a third way would be not to use. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think what you're you're talking about is um, this sort of like cognitive mapping. Yeah. Where we're well, using, yeah. but but like it's sort of uh, bringing it to something more analytical. Well, no, but you can combine it because you're talking about the fact that you want to get a metadata. So the metadata part is the cognitive mapping part. Combined with the, the model, and that yeah, you can correlate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can correlate. Yeah. 
you can still be very work intensive if you have 700 samples. Before. No, but you, you can do it on the fly because I can imagine that you're doing this while you're using the stuff. You know, the map says, oh yeah, these things are just like each other. You say, no, they're not. You know, and you just get on with what you're doing. You just push them apart. Because, mm -hmm. because when I'm performing, I often make little spatial mnemonics for myself. I can easily remember during the time of the concert stuff if I can spatialize these and then I can push them apart. So I think having a flexible interface for doing that and one that remembers because of the way you behave with it mm -hmm. would give, provide you with a lot of interesting subjective data that you're getting from the personal data, not just the physical analysis. Right. Sorry? We're going to get to that too. Uh, yes. The <laughs> <laughs> um, a second part is uh, if the computer does choose uh, things that are, it's going to suggest to you, how is it going to organize them? Now, there are many different ways that this could happen, but one of the ways that we have been looking into are um, uh, the self-organizing maps. And these are ways that... Uh, the data um, it chooses to, uh, to group together sounds that are similar. So this is uh, a self-organized map, and uh, it's in two dimensions, but uh, actually every, every little part of it has three, three color components, RGB. So um, on every, every one of them, if you, uh, you can have three different sets of data. Uh, incorporated into the color of it. So when you look at the uh, at the map like this, areas that uh, have the same color have more or less the same col uh, the same uh, qualities of sound. But also the closer they are, the closer their their sound qualities are going to be. And this is a, a way that uh, these these maps can organize the samples for us. Um, they're some kind of a neural network. And uh, basically, when you start them up, it's just uh, take some examples, some vectors, and it trains itself. Um, also, usually they are toroidal, meaning that one side is connected to the other. Basically, well, yeah, much like a paper. I can do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's and when we were thinking about this. Uh, this, yeah, this function that we would like out of our instrument, the suggestions. Uh, the last, uh, another aspect that we have been examining is, uh, can our system have an hour? Yeah, it's uh, how the system is going to choose what it's going to, to play, what it's going to suggest. And this can happen um, if, for example, your system is watching what are your choices in uh, uh, your samples throughout some performances uh, in the past, then in the present time when you're performing, it can um, make comparisons and see what would be relevant material to suggest to you uh, so that you can use. But this is one aspect, so actually it's a bit comforting. It gives you things that you would like to use so that you have a performance that doesn't go very much out of the way, but still it has some variation. Or you could really ask the computer to give you stuff that is not very relevant to what you have been doing mm -hmm. so far, and this way create a challenge you and somehow throw you into unknown waters during the performance. Um, Another uh, aspect of, of it that we have been looking into is uh, when you have data, when you have parameters that are connected to a controller, you might do some movement, and uh, this uh, creates, uh, this affects uh, a certain effect or a parameter to your software instrument. But uh, if your system uh, compares and learns from other performances that you have done, maybe itself can change uh, what your movement uh, means into something that is similar. So the system is changing, in, it's adapting to what you're doing in a way that you cannot really be analytical about if the system is changing the parameters that you're affecting in real time without you knowing it. Then it means that you don't know exactly what you're doing, but what you know is the system. When you have played with the system many times, you know how it's going to respond. And um, you, yeah, you learn this aspect of the system and it can be more creative, more challenging, and create more interesting results in the way that 
you do play with the computer. The computer is not just your tool, but it's something that it's changing and adapting, and it's, this creates, I, I think, a whole different aesthetic towards uh, live performance and instrumentalism. And this is what we've done. Yeah. <laughs> lately. Um. Yeah, I think now we actually would like to, since we have a lot of uh, experts really here mm -hmm. inside of here, we would really like to have some some uh, influence also from, from you. If um, you can think of any other techniques or technologies which we might overlook, which, which you think it might be worth for us to look at. So, are there any kind of um, um, similar uh, interest there, for instance, in, in sciences or in, in industries which we may have uh, overlooked. Yeah, I was, I was just talking to somebody about uh, gaming technology mm -hmm. and how they actually kind of figured out a way now to track your brain so that you put something on your head and you can actually tell the character which way to go in these like MMORPGs or them. And I mean, really, it seems like the logical where all of it, everything is going. I mean, also with music, right? Because as soon as we can actually get in between the ears, you know? Yeah. It doesn't matter if you're using samples or like generative techniques, you know? If you, if you hear a sound and you want that sound in one of 5,000 speakers that you're working with, then it will be there, you know? So I mean, obviously, that's completely not where we are right now. <laughs> is that where, but, uh, is that is that where we want to be? Yeah, it's like a body and soul of three. Well, I mean, I, you know, I personally come from kind of a traditional compositional background with pencil and paper, and that's basically what what you're trying to do: get ideas from in your head into the world. At least that's the sort of the song. Uh, my personal feeling is that composers are very alienated from musicians. Our way is the contemporary music composers are very alienated from music and from musicians. Yeah, I would agree. And it's because of the practice in conservatory, which is separated into this class, you might say. And my students in conservatory are really trying to convince them that they really have to go back get the from musicians who are playing music. Yeah, I would, I would actually say that the. Uh, <coughs> This notion that a some some sort of a brain reader would be the ultimate instrument <clears throat> is sort of a paradigm example of a kind of thinking that says that um, our body, that what matters in our body is our brain. Mm -hmm. And if we can just figure out a way to bypass our body and get right from our brain to a machine that uh, this will be a huge step forward. And I, I profoundly disagree with this. I, I, I don't think that the brain is what matters and all this other stuff is just baggage we carry around with us. I think actually um, we're complete units. It's a system you can't. Um, so so, so uh, you know, I, I, I predict that all the work in this direction of uh, brain computer interface would be um, fruitless. Or just brain to brain. Anyone has said that it would be ultimate. I think that well, it was just a gesture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and I think yeah, there is a greater understanding of, of mind body connection, but that we should explore these technical mm -hmm. possibilities because they make it makes sense to you. It makes sense to understand. Well, you just said it makes sense. <laughs> can I just can I just modify one just for actual clarity is that I'm also a trumpet player. I've played the trumpet for like twenty years. Okay. Oh, yeah. so, no, I don't mean there's extra. Of course you have to do that. I think, to me, it seems like the ideal thing would be to be able to basically play music by dancing and also be able to think to modify parameters and sort of uh, mess with uh, aspects of the music on the fly that I don't already have mappings of sensors or whatever connected to myself. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like the, uh, 
the that's the, the solution to the multi-dimensional problem is let your brain play with those dimensions while you're yeah, yeah. messing with the two or three you talk your fingers to play or whatever. So it's not like it's a all or nothing thing. Another thing related to gaming that I was thinking is um, one thing I think nice games do is they start you really simple yeah. and you can sort of learn to master one dimension of things and then once you've kind of gotten to level two, then you get an extra spell or an extra feature on your race car or whatever. And I think that's something missing in music. It could be cool. Is that in music? If you practice, that's the instrument. instruments. Instruments and, and practicing and stuff in general. I think that there's some somehow. I mean, at least in my own experience, uh, practicing an instrument. Doesn't have the same kind of uh, yeah. addictive quality as mm -hmm. that yeah. starting a game at a basic level and sort of working your way working your way up does. Yeah. But it, I think it has the potential to. Yeah. If you sort of structure and practice differently, maybe sort of digital instruments could be a, a nice platform for being able to do that. Yeah. The thing about the just to pick up on the sort of the dying part of the the, uh, the brain thing is I've done a little work with brain data, and the real problem there is that it's actually really to control what you're thinking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a real problem. Because the brain is really scary. <laughs> so even if you really think, damn, I want that thing over there, I want it over there, and your brain like goes, ooh, what? Well, <laughs> and, ooh, what? Well, you know, somebody just left the room, or and it's hot in here, or I have to go to the brain to them. And it, 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 it's, I've, I've done a lot of work with some of the MIT stuff where they try to use brain and also uh, things like skin interfaces uh, to, to exactly to do gaming. And the real problem with it is that unless you really sit down and think, all right, I'm going to think about absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to really, really take <laughs> myself this machine. Mm -hmm. That's the issue. You should probably talk about it. I guess. And your brain no, the issue, no, the the issue is to identify your brain with your consciousness, which is not exactly that's the problem with the brain waves. One way to learn that is that consciousness is a simulation of the brain. Yeah, exactly. It's not really what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> and so, in a sense, but, but in the case of classical music, as I can finish, but also in physics, clearly they've identified the process of making music with this consciousness. And all the other stuff that happens in subconscious can't possibly be music because it's very important that we distinguish between the class of people who make decisions. And class people who really in the band. I think it's a social, it's a social problem. It's a European social problem. That they identify this whole thing. It's all this industrial revolution stuff. I'm sure, if we go back to the world, we wouldn't have this problem. But somehow, in the 19th century, we ended up with this problem that we're stuck with today, which is kind of a class thing about this. And the problem is people like, here's something. You want both. You want to be able to make conscious decisions. But you also don't want to be able to play the trumpet, right? You want both. And some trumpets and trumpet samples are not the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, to go back to what you were saying, uh, so what you would need is some sort of uh, intermediate device in between the brain and the output that would sort of get all the jitter out and get all the, uh, you know, filter out all the irrelevant data and somehow map all that scattered and skitterish brain data down into intentional activity. There's a device that does that. It's evolved over millions of years. It's called your body. <laughs> <laughs> so it's when, you, right yeah, <laughs> so when, when you take that out, you're basically undoing uh, yeah. you know, millions you of years of evolution. So, I mean, that's the problem I was trying to say, is that, the, that when, you're, when you're doing stuff like sticking sensors in your brain, you know, those things are a really dumb version of your brain as well. Yeah, it's not a really You only have two hands and ten fingers and four limbs. And if you can, if you can start mapping uh, from your brain, then you can sort of become extra digital. You got to get one thing to one. Yeah, you can get twelve trumpets simultaneously or something. Can I ask a question to you guys? Is the Stein Research Group, which I think is a really yeah cool. Concept <laughs> because it doesn't necessarily, in my mind, mean music, right? So, is is the goal to research musical applications of the technology? Because in in this case, like what you guys are talking about, 
you put it more, in my mind, like, kind of abstract. I mean, you're really you're talking about, like, existence and the body and the mind and, and all these really, you know, kind of more profound concepts, whereas, I'm asking you guys, you think it's your goal more Well, I mean, for, that, that brings up an interesting point. Um, that's kind of where we're at, is asking ourselves that question. You know, do, do we even want to make music with our bodies anymore? Or do we want to move on to like a, a purely cerebral sort of music making? You know, and, that, and I think that's what the computer does. It makes you want to virtualize things. Mm -hmm. It makes you want to get away from the body because now everything that you just took for granted as being physical is now going on in here. I completely disagree. Okay. Being a, a software programmer, I deal most of the language all the time. And so I guess it's sort of what you're saying in terms of about why my mind thinks something, converts it to a music form, and I somehow inject it magic into the computer and it does what I want. Uh, however, I have to do that through my fingers. And I use text editor, which I'm very familiar with, and it feels like I'm doing some interesting physical activity. And so a lot of it is, isn't about brains, it's about the, the fingers that memorize a particular piece or mm -hmm. the compass. So I, I, I don't agree. I think, I think that I think there's an aspect, obviously, is uh, linguistics, which is coming from the brain. I don't know, I'm different, so the word is using here. But very nice thing, it's about, about trying to get the, the thought directly from your head into the thing you're trying to create. But it still has to come with the body. Yeah, okay, but that, that is lacking in the producer music, electronic music practice. Yes. The thing that yes. you just said is programming through your fingers, it could be enough, just your fingers in this case, but in terms of musical performance or making music through your performance, making music live, which is all times of that, then you, you, you feel like it's becoming, yeah, you're really losing the, the, the going through the body notion. I mean, it's, it's becoming your fingertips. Mm -hmm. Your mouse, your eyes, your stuck, and your 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 musical expression what you're creating is not represented by. How is that different from being a DJ? A well, DJ is a kind of a oh, well, more well, more lots of interesting part of it. I think it holds most of the value. No, I think that, that some of this that you're saying is, is very relevant also to playing instruments, considering the classical instruments that don't have any computers inside them, like the clarinet or an accordion mm -hmm. or the mm -hmm. bass, it's not just the mind deciding to play a certain note and telling the body to make a certain move. A lot of it has been trained. There's this, this muscle memory. There's a lot of subconscious stuff in there. There's even a sensuality, feeling the instrument making mm -hmm. the right note or the wrong note in, in the body. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't see how being purely cerebral and basically mm -hmm. telling the computer what to do by typing mm -hmm. words or by clicking the mouse has that same level of subtlety. Mm -hmm. Can't possibly ever have that same level of subtlety. That's why there's also gesture researches going on. That's why they're really looking into it. Is there something that they can extract and apply to the whole instrument building? That that would again let you return back to your body and use it. This is why I mean, like, there's always this thing of like, can you build? The thing about having a physical object mm. is think physical object that isn't that machine owner. You know, that, that doesn't work, each key doesn't really have this part of labeling, doesn't really have an identity, it can be whatever depending on which program is currently open. Mm -hmm. This thing about having a thing that you can hit, it means that you have. You can externalize some of the processes. You do not have to hold it on on your head. You can actually use that fantastic filtering and understanding mechanism that I was talking about to do some of the work. You can have texture, you can have all sorts of things. You can also think like, that's also another thing, just physical ability. You know, training yourself to be able to do a particular thing, which is absolutely key to all instruments of work. Mm -hmm. and, and then also then having training a particular movement change, for example. Even when you're a guitarist, building up a certain amount of hard skin mm -hmm. to not like, mm -hmm. lose your guitar, yeah. <laughs> yeah. to play certain things. I think that there's a, there's a need for making physical, or physical like in interfaces to some of these things you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And yes, it's hard. Mm -hmm. And no, they don't have spiritual in here. And maybe they have, the great thing about 
making it physical is that you can put it down and walk away. You can, you can <laughs> relate to it in space as a person with a body and a mind. Connecting to one thing you just said, what would you think about you know, all the research you've done? Um, could be one of the different purposes kind of lowering the level of uh, technique that the person has to have to play music. Because mm -hmm. my guess, my, kind of my feeling would be there's a lot of inspiration which is not there out there. Because also people just don't have time and don't have the skills to actually have those uh, physical abilities that you were mentioning. But they could still be great musicians for what they for their inspiration. And maybe with some of the other, you can lower the barrier of playing an instrument. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's also something we were wondering about that um, we just feel that, I mean, this machine just gives so much more options and so much more power than, say, a 70s synthesizer. But still, we mm -hmm. just, just now, today, we just play around a 70s synthesizer and we just go, oh, this is awesome, this is great. And, it's just, um, I, I don't feel that this is any more exciting me anymore than touching this yeah, old machine which is really limited and yeah, really unintuitive in many ways. But coming from what he just said, there's also like, does today thing that like require any skill or not necessarily require any skill, but you, can, you don't have to have a certain skill, but you could still be a good musician kind of thing. I think that's just what we discussed, and actually, it's kind of into this whole expectation of kind of craftsmanship or kind of virtue as a team, what we're doing. And I don't know, I mean, that was just a recent discussion. I, I, maybe you should walk up into this because I, I do personally believe you that it's a possible change, and I don't know. Well, I'll talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it, it, one way for me to do with it for audiences who want to think about music is think about sports. Imagine you're like a skateboarder, and I'm going to make you a skateboard so anybody can skateboard. <laughs> Am I going to be able to sell that one? Yes, but if our skateboards come by, no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, so for me, I know that I really respect musical skills. Another thing that could happen, if, it, because we have instruments now that are lower than bar, that, that's yeah. already there. Well, garage band. Yeah. I mean, there, there's uh, uh, doing some kind of activity that results in sound that you can claim somehow as your own. It's quite simple on a computer. Very, very simple.